Hi guys and welcome back to today's video. Today we are covering chapter 323 of My Hero Academia. As y'all know, last week Shonen Jump was on break and I know we are all itching for a new chapter. So, without further ado, let's hop right in the video. The chapter begins with a flashback of the students at the principal's office, just before they went after Deku. Ida remembers what the principal said about showing everyone how great the UA barrier really is, but he thinks that if they can bring Midoriya back peacefully, that will be enough to calm the civilians down. Nezu disagrees, saying that the issue is bigger than that. Deku is currently the hero's trump card, so keeping him sheltered without proper security would pose a greater risk to everyone. He compares the security level of UA to that of Tartarus, and says that after the gate was destroyed by Shigaraki at the beginning of the school year, he worked hard to improve it. Now the UA barrier is not only a barrier, it makes UA move. The campus has been divided into several areas, and all of them are connected to motorized elevator-like devices. If any sign of invasion is detected, all these areas will be transported to an underground shelter, and from then they can follow various underground routes. That's actually kind of crazy. I had no idea UA's barrier system since the first breach has made that much of a giant jump. The ability upon detection of invasion to merely go underground seems kind of busted. So I guess Nezu and all of the UA staff have really been overly prepared for a moment like this. And I wasn't really expecting nearly this much defense. I thought it was going to be more so the students and the other heroes having to defend a ton, which I'm sure they will do, of course. But I didn't expect this to be the equivalent protection as Tartarus, which is amazing to see. Kaminari says this sounds something straight out of a robot anime, and Nezu goes on to explain it furthermore. The underground of the whole area around UA has been covered with 3,000 layers of fortified metal plates. Any abnormality in at least one of them activates the security system and the elevators. I love that Kaminari really echoes us as an audience that it sounds something straight out of a robot anime. In addition, the plates also serve to hold back any villains that are trying to attack, giving students and civilians time to get to the underground shelter. Other hero schools have also reinforced their security and are being connected to these routes, Shiketsu being one of them. As mentioned in a previous chapter about Shiketsu, I was really interested to see how they were all connected, but given these underground routes, that's pretty amazing. And now, I'm not sure how many total hero schools there are within Japan, but given that they're being connected, I'm sure we'll be introduced to more characters along with some of our favorites from Shiketsu. Tokoyama comments that this metal plate structure seems specifically designed to deal with Shigaraki's awakened quirk, which spreads to other surfaces. He asked why the director had already set this up before even the cultural festival began, when there was not much available information about Shigaraki's quirk. Nezu says that he just followed his instinct, even without concrete evidence. He says that even something incomprehensible or unnecessary can be the missing step to reach the end of a challenging path. So here right now is something kind of fishy in my opinion. There's been a lot of talks about UA's traitors, but there's also a duality to it, because if the traitor did exist, perhaps the traitor leaked some of the information regarding what was going to happen to Shigaraki and his awakened quirk within Decay. So it makes me kind of question, Nezu might know who the traitor is, which is very concerning. It cuts back to the present, with the civilians refusing to let Deku in. Deku's mom, Bakugo's mom, Jiro's parents, Eri in the dorms with Class B, and Koda with Ragdoll are shown, and all of them are extremely concerned. Number 13 comments that some people were convinced by the principal's speech, but not all of them. And Genus interrupts Mike's shouting and starts talking to the civilians, explaining that the heroes tried to use Deku to attract the villains, but it didn't work. He says that even though Deku is Shigaraki's target, he is also the hero's greatest weapon. He understands that this is not the ideal situation, but says it's the best alternative and asks them to let Midoriya stay in UA until he's ready to fight once again. The civilians seem to get even angrier saying that the country is only in such chaos because the heroes failed, and now, having failed again, they want to force the civilians to take this risk. As they yell, Deku's danger sense activates, and he looks stunned. Guys, remember, whenever he was fighting Class 1A, I say fighting with loose terms, his danger sense never even activated, there was never no immediate threat, but now with these civilians, there is. But before the civilians can do anything, Uraka grabs Mike's megaphone, uses her quirk on herself, and floats over the civilians, straight to Yue's rooftop. Uraraka begins her speech by confirming that Deku does indeed have a special power. The civilians reply, saying that this is exactly why he can't stay there. But Uraraka says that this is exactly what Deku himself was thinking. He tried to stay away, and all of his classmates needed to bring him back. She continues, asking the civilians to take a good look at how Deku looks now. 
after holding the burden all by himself. There are some panels emphasizing his claw-like hands and feet, and some shocked civilians looking at him. Uraraka says that Deku is the one who wants to change the current situation the most, and that he keeps moving forward for other people's sake, even though he knew he could get attacked at any moment. If you're anything like me right now, you have absolute chills in this chapter. I have, it, it is amazing to see her speak to this audience this way, and absolutely everything we expected and needed from Uraraka as a character to be the consolidation of what Deku needs in terms of emotional support, and be an ally in terms of winning the people over to Deku and having the people understand that Deku is not something that should be kept out of these walls and, and isolated, that instead he is a resource for them and for society. He is the weapon, for lack of a better term, that these individuals need to be protected by, and he's the only one who can stop Shigaraki. The giant woman Deku saved in chapter 310 appears and recognizes him. Uraraka continues shouting, saying that having a special power doesn't make Deku a special person. Bakugo then appears by Midoriya's side, saying that civilians desperately rioting while ignoring the security system is a perfect example of something Deku can't handle by himself and needs to leave it to others. It cuts to an internal monologue from Nezu, acknowledging that taking the first step is always hard. However, he thinks that this step in a specific way will lead to the birth of a hero who surpasses even All Might. The chapter ends here, and the last panel is Uraraka screaming at these civilians in the rain. Wow, this was a really intense chapter. For one of the first times in a while, we've seen Deku's danger sense truly be activated, which shows the magnitude of what these civilians and these citizens think of Deku. They think of Deku as so much of a threat and someone they don't want within these walls that they're willing to harm him and possibly even kill him, which is sickening. As Bakugo said in previous chapters, that whatever Deku can't handle, they will handle, and as, as mentioned, this is exactly what he's talking about. Deku couldn't possibly speak to these civilians and win them over, but here we have best girl, Uraraka, speaking to these civilians and letting them know that Deku is a person just like them. Yes, he may have one for all. That doesn't mean that he's not someone just like them. Deku is still a high schooler at the end of the day, and these civilians are losing lack of their own reasoning and their morality because they are lost in the chaos that their society has been brought to by Shigaraki. Also, one of the craziest parts about this chapter, Nezu is absolutely sus, and did we just get confirmed that he could perhaps be the traitor? There is no way Nezu could have got this information unless he was working with one of the traitors to begin with, which, if he was, that would only by association make him also a traitor along with the person giving him this information. I know there's been a lot of speculation regarding which of these students could be traitors, but I definitely, at this point, I'm not convinced it's the student. I really do think it is Nezu. And although he is outwardly entirely innocent from what we've seen all throughout My Hero Academia, it only makes him more suspicious. As we know, there's a gamut of characters within My Hero Academia who aren't entirely innocent, but they're heroic because that's what humans are. No humans are entirely innocent or evil at the end of the day. So just like our hero Endeavor, Endeavor has his flaws, but at the end of the day, we know where he stands on things. Nezu just seems like an ultimate good. And for him to have these kind of preparations before even the cultural sports festival, that might almost confirm that he may in fact be the traitor, which is absolutely heinous. But I think that theory lies for a video upcoming this week that I'll be releasing regarding Nezu being the traitor. So if you want to hear more about that, be on the lookout for this video in this upcoming week. Guys, if you haven't already, please don't forget to drop a like, comment, and subscribe. I'm really pushing for a thousand subscribers by 2022, and given the momentum and support from you all over these recent days and weeks, I really think it's possible. So, as always, have a beautiful day, and I'll catch you all next time.